Der Klett-Cotter-Blog ist diesmal bei Klett-Cotter selber im Haus. Neben uns sitzt David Graeber. Hello, David Graeber. You are a professor of anthropology in, at the London School of Economics in London. You have a very long list of publications of books and articles. Your first book was published in 2001, Taught an Anthropological Theory of Value, the False Coin of Our Own Dreams. Mm -hmm. We met for the first time in Cologne during the le your lecture of your book, Debt, the First oh, 5,000 yeah. Years, published in 2011 and released by Klett Cotter in 2012. Mm -hmm. The book cover said that you are an anarchist activist. Hmm. Could you elaborate the meaning of this label? Ah, well, I don't really make it up. Um, I'm, I, I, when people ask about my political philosophy, I say I guess I'm an anarchist because um, for me that means two things. That means I believe it would be possible someday to have a truly free society, but a truly free society would be one based, which isn't based on bureaucracies of violence, you know, uh, which isn't based on the constant threat of physical force, uh, a society of free association of, of uh, uh, based on a voluntary basis. And, and so for me, anarchism simply means a commitment to the idea that someday it would be possible to have a truly free society, but also it's an ethical commitment that you don't bring about freedom by working through its opposite. You don't, you know, strengthen the state so as to eventually eliminate the state. You don't, you don't operate through institutions which you think are inherently corrupt and ultimately based on violence like governments, corporations, and so forth, but try to create what we call prefigurative politics, that is, to, to as much as possible to let your own ways of, of dealing with other people, and especially within social movements, embody the kind of world you want to create. Mm -hmm. I have read somewhere your theory is anarchist anthropology. Is this, no. is this right or? No, 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 no. I actually wrote a book, and it was on my old advisor, Marshall Solomon, had a pamphlet series. And he said, oh, why don't you write a book about anarchism, a little pamphlet about anarchism? And I, I wrote this thing called Fragments of an Anarchist Anthropology. But if you look at the book, what it says is, why is it there is no such thing as an anarchist anthropology? So <laughs> it, it isn't actually, you know, like, yes, I'm an anarchist anthropologist. Um, I just do anthropology. And I think that, you know, uh, it's interesting that anthropology has a lot to contribute to social movements, uh, particularly anti-authoritarian ones. But no, I, the theory that I do is, is not itself particularly anarchist. In fact, one of the things I say in the in the book is that there's an interesting distinction between Marxism and, and, and anarchism and so far as you can have a Marxist anthropology or a Marxist sociology quite easily but that's because Marxism is essentially a theoretical discourse about revolutionary strategy whereas anarchism is more an ethical discourse about revolutionary practice um, you know if you look at the history of Marxism it always comes out of the brain of some great intellectual I mean the different insofar as there's <clears throat> Excuse me. Insofar as there's different varieties of Marxism, there's Leninists and Trotskyists or Althusserians. You know, it just goes from heads of state to French professors, just is fine. Um, whereas anarchists don't say, I'm a Kropotkinite and you're a Bakuninist. You know, they don't name themselves after some theorists. They talk about the practice, like, you know, I'm an individualist or you're a anarcho syndicalist or so forth and so on. Um, so, so anarchism is about the doing. And, and, which is one reason why it's kind of hard to see how exactly it fits into academia. Yeah. Fine. Last year your book, the, the Utopia of Rules, was launched. Hans Freundl and Henning Dedekind have translated the title Bürokratie, the Utopie der Regeln, mm -hmm. for Klett Cotta. The English subtitle mm -hmm. was the title. Um, <laughs> uh, on, on technology, mm -hmm. stupidity and the secret joys of bureaucracy yeah. suggests that this is a critical essay about bureaucracy. The cover of your book shows a form which will become only valid if you use the right field for signature. Yes. Yes. Are, are rules are necessary for bureaucracy, or do we have even a certain preference or desire for rules? Yeah, one of, one of the things I wanted to understa understand in, when writing the book um, was both why is it that everybody hates bureaucracy so much? But second of all, why is it that despite the fact that we all claim to hate it, we always get more and more of it? So there must be some secret level on which we, we actually really love it. And I was trying to play around with that and get to the heart of, 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 of the sort. Because you know, if you are trying to fight uh, bureaucracy, and I, I argue that 
you know, a left-wing critique of bureaucracy is desperately needed, you nonetheless need to understand the secret appeal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, forms regulate not only the American medical system. You describe your bad experiences, but our whole life is subjected to rules. And these rules could be a sort of legal incapacitation mm -hmm. of all of us, a deprivation of decision making. Yeah, I mean, to some degree, it's, it's infantilizing. And, and we, we kind of infantilize ourselves in that if mature adults are people who can come together and, and make arrangements based on sort of reasonable uh, appreciation of the other person's needs and points of view. I mean, that's usually how psychologists define maturity. Um, being able to sort of go to a group of people, everybody sort of takes into consideration the other's perspective, and they come to some c practical compromise about things. Well, you know, in a way, we live in a society where we never get to do that. Mm -hmm. um, it's not... You know, instead, every aspect of our lives, especially in public, but you know, in general, is actually regulated by endless codes, uh, administrative ordinances, that, you know, who can stand where, who can, do, you know, sell or smoke or eat or, play, um, you know, anything you can do, you might do in public. There's endless laws, and those laws are enforced by violence. No. So there are people with weapons who are there to, you know, threaten to hit us if we don't, if we don't obey even the tiniest little rules. And one of the things that really fascinated me when writing the book is the role of police. Mm -hmm. Perhaps this does come from the fact that I'm, I'm thinking about the anarchist tradition, who theorize police more than most political groups. But you know, the fact that most of what police do is enforce administrative ordinances. Now, very little of what they have to do on a day-to-day -day basis has anything to do with crime, even though we think of them as fighting crime and especially violent crime. Actually, what they do is they bring the possibility of violence into situations, you know, selling uh, untaxed cigarettes, for example, that you know, it would never normally be uh, uh, any danger of violence had they not shown up. Um, is the total bureaucratization mm -hmm. an insignia of our age? Are there no differences between public and private bureaucracies? Well, of course there are formally, but the, the, they too, uh, the area of overlap is so, uh, seems to be larger than the area where they're distinct. Um, they've come together to such a point that it's very, very hard in many cases to know which one you're dealing with. Uh, the example I, I, I always give is when you're my bank. At one point, I spent an hour on the phone of my bank uh, trying to They'd put in some new security system, and I was no longer able to access my account. Um, and I tried to get it straightened out. It took about an hour. I got nowhere. And you know, I talked to this person. They sent me to that person. That was the wrong person. They, everybody kept losing my information. They gave me a runaround. They sent me to non-existent numbers. Um, it was a classic bureaucratic runaround, wild goose chase. But you know, this is a private bank, right? It seems obvious what's going on here. It's private bureaucracy. But if you complain to people who work for banks about this sort of thing, especially up, higher ups, they always say, oh, it's all because of the government regulation. You know, everything we do is regulated by the government. We really have no choice. Then if you look at how they pass the regulation, you discover that most of it is written by the bank. Mm -hmm. So they hire these lawyers that write up the drafts of the laws they'd like to have regulating them. And, you know, they give money to politicians and their lobbyists present this. And the lobbyists and the aides to the politicians sort of meet and negotiate and they come up with a legislative regime. So is this a private bank? You know, is this a private bureaucracy or a public one? It's, it's impossible to say. Yeah. Yeah. We all seem to accept bureaucracy. And during your investigations, did you f not find or any real desire to change it? Oh, I think people desire to change it all the time, but they, they kind of feel completely alienated from the possibility of doing so. It never really occurs to people that they could have any influence in the way bureaucracy works. Someone once pointed out in America, for example, the way people use the word us and them. Um, you know, if you're talking about your city and you talk about street signs, you know, you say, oh, you know, look, they put in another light here, I wish they would take that thing down. It's always them. You don't know who they are, you know. They're this, uh, on the other hand, if like your city's sports team, you know, um, <laughs> has a victory, it's like, we won, you know. <laughs> so you identify with one, but, you know, even though these people are supposed to be your political representatives who work for you, I mean, the sports team doesn't actually work for you, um, you know, you see it as this alien thing that you couldn't possibly influence. Mm. Um, one precision, 
We, you talked about already about the infantilization. Is the word stupidity in your subtitle related to your opinion? You, you write instruments th through which the human imagination is smashed and shattered. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. I, this also goes back to the role of violence, which I think is very under theorized. We don't like to think about violence. We think, you know, especially the sort of pervasive violence of our social relations, that things that affect us because, well, it's a little embarrassing, and um, modern life is largely about the denial of the role of violence in these things. Um, but it occurred to me that, um, that violence creates lopsided structures of the imagination. That was the phrase I came up with, in that when you have a situation, you know, where, well, if two people are equally matched in their ability to do violence, right, well, you know, they have to get inside each other's heads, right, if I'm fighting you, having a duel, something like that. But if one side has all the means of violence and the other doesn't, the first thing that means is that the person with access to the means of violence doesn't really have to think very much about the other person, because violence is one of the only means that you can influence people without really understanding them. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that Often you don't have to understand them, but it holds out that possibility. And the more, uh, which almost no other form of action does, that's the unique property of violence. So, so structural inequalities, whether it's patriarchy or racism or um, class structures, any, any structure where, where one group of per people has preponderant power over another and it's backed up by ultimately by a threat of force, which they always turn out to be, well, the people with the on top tend to not have to do much imagination um, and think, do not really think about what's going on from the perspective of the people on the bottom. However, the people on the bottom have to do a lot of thinking about what's going on from the perspective of the people on top. And, and paradoxically enough, human beings being the sort of empathetic creatures that we are, when you imagine people, you identify with them, you care about them. So as a result, one of the perverse effects of violence, of systematic violence in our society, is that the people who are, have access to threaten others with violence, um, those people will care about them much more than they care about the people they're threatening. Mm. Um, you start your book with the iron law of liberalism oh, yeah. and state a problem for our government that each attempt to reduce Bureaucracy increases the red tape for our governments. Is this an iron rule also? I haven't found any exceptions. Um, I've looked into it. I mean, I haven't you know, researched it at great length, but I tried to think of ones. Um, the, 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 the thing which first struck me when I was coming up with this formulation was the um, case of Russia. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, if you look from like 19... 91 or 92 till 10 years later, World Bank kept statistics, um, and they found that the no total number of bureaucrats in that period went up from 1 million to 1 million point 25. That's really uh, quite remarkable when you consider that this is the period of shock therapy, when in theory they um, got rid of the Soviet-style bureaucratic rule. So, but not only that, the economy shrank considerably and the overall population shrank. Yet, nonetheless, they still ended up with more government bureaucrats, substantially more government bureaucrats than they had before. And that's just counting the government ones, right? Because they set up all these corporations and private, um, private bureaucracies that hadn't even existed. So the total number of bureaucrats, including both public and private, must have been even higher than that. Mm -hmm. Your historical analysis is very interesting. I think there's very much matter also for a next book of the historical um, economic, for example. Through the cover, for the cover text of your book does not really mention that you investigate also for the roots of bureaucracy mm -hmm. and you shed a light on this development through the ages. Mm -hmm. Could not even the Enlightenment um, stop the predominance of bureaucratic rules? Oh, I mean... Uh in a way, Enlightenment was very interesting that way because it, it challenged the idea of received authority, but it created a charter for um, a new type of bureaucracy or increased bureaucratization. Uh, people forget that the sort of model for the nation state that people like Leibniz um, and others really embraced was based on China. Um, at that time, uh, especially in the very early period of Enlightenment, Asian models of the state were considered obviously superior and more rational. Um, you know, if you think about it, 
the model of the nation state that led to our contemporary bureaucratized society, the ideal was always, well, we'd like to have a single nation all speaking the same language, united in a single political regime with uniform set of laws, and we have a uniform administration, and that should be cho chosen on meritocratic standards by people educated in the vernacular literature. You know, nothing like that had existed at any point in European history before that. But that was exactly the system they believed to exist in China, which was the most bureaucratized society um, that existed at that time. So in a way, the modern European nation state is the Chinese bureaucratic model. Mm -hmm. And it was brought in by the Enlightenment. Yeah. As a kid, I had a little post office for children yeah. with forms and stamps. Did you? Yes. Cool. Perhaps I learned already at this moment something about the magic forces of the post. My post office was a game. Perhaps I was happy to fill a form for a registered post so illegible as a post office official. Finally, you say that the fascination of bureaucracy is a sort of fear to playing. Yeah, this was a hypothesis. I mean, because I remember being very impressed at one point when I read that um, about half of children's play, children of a certain age, I can't remember exactly what it was, consists of arguing about the rules. So, you know, just improvising gets boring. I mean, the pure play will necessarily turn into games, into things where you have rules and everybody has to argue about exactly what the rules are. Um, and, and I thought that dynamic was really interesting. I mean, the way the same thing happens in language, right? Languages are always changing. Why should languages always change? It doesn't make any sense. I mean, from a functional point of view, once you get your grammar down and have a useful vocabulary, you'd think it would stay the same, right? Because, um, you know, changing it around will just confuse people. But in fact, there's no language on earth that doesn't continually change. Um, and the only possible explanation is that people get bored. They like to play around with stuff. They like to have fun with it. Uh, and that's true whether you're in Norway or New Guinea or Amazonia or any place else. But at the same time, as soon as you write a grammar book, everybody will say, if the language changes, oh, they're doing it wrong. You know, the moment you have this authority there, people believe it. So there's this kind of tension between the idea that this thing should be governed by fixed rules and the fact that, in fact, everybody likes to fool around with it. So we both need to play, but we also need, we will tend to believe anyone that tells us that we shouldn't. And you know, I thought, well, why is that? I guess there is something kind of scary about play. Um, because it's so unpredictable. In the Hindu system, the universe is, is, is the play of the gods. The gods are at play. And I thought, you know, gods at play would be gods I'd really rather avoid. <laughs> Who wants to be around gods when they're having fun? <laughs> God knows what would happen. <laughs> um, yeah. so, so in a way, I could see that. There's something kind of terrifying. There's something incredibly appealing, but there's also something terrifying in the idea of play. Whereas bureaucracy is... You know, it appeals to the opposite. It appeals to that sense that wouldn't it be nice if I knew exactly what the rules are? Mm -hmm. And the phrase utopia of rules in, in um, the title of the book, that's what, it refers to games. Games are a utopia of rules. Because I realize, well, what is it we really enjoy about games? Well, there's different things. There's a thrill of competition, doubt to some degree. But it's also the fact that that's contained within a set of rules. And you know, I thought, well, you know, it's true that in life there's always lots of rules about what's going on, you know, but you're never quite sure what they are. You know, imagine you're in a workplace and there's some kind of rivalry going on. Um, you know, who's playing, who isn't playing, what's a fair move, what isn't, how do you know you won? It's all very unclear. On the other hand, you know, in a game, they tell you. It's like, these are the players, these are not. You know, here's when it starts, here's where it ends, here's how you win, here are the rules, go. So it's the only situation you have in life where you know exactly what the rules are, and you can play by the rules and still win. Let me only repeat the, my fascination for your book, because there's <laughs> historical analysis, mm -hmm. the theory of play, and um, histori historical um, economic of um, history of economics, that's very interesting, regarding the world changing technologies. Uh -huh. The internet with its social networks could be described as a form of communication subjected to a collection of ingenious rules with which reduce, simplify and finally prevent or stop communication. Mm -hmm. In spite of this danger, we hope to realize social relationships which would not exist without the internet. Could this explain the fascination we have also every sort of rules, I would call this a sort of social bureaucratic rules, mm. for example, mm -hmm. the number of likes of Twitter could disable our imagination. 
Yeah, it's a way of channeling imagination and bureaucratizing it in a way I could see that. I mean, I made a similar argument with games, computer games, that you, know, you have fantasy literature is based on trying to imagine a completely unbureaucratized society, almost as a warning. You know, Middle Earth might be fun, but would you really want to live there, you know? So you both have the thrill of imagining like what a life with no bureaucracy at all would let you like, but also you feel safe when you go back and, um, to your own otherwise boring existence. But, you know, in a way you can think social media is the same. Oh, but, but once you have that fantasy, I'm sorry. Uh, once you have that fantasy, then what do they do? They turn it into games, you know, first into Dungeons and Dragons where you have numbers and statistics for every aspect of like, you know, here's my intelligence, here's my wisdom, here's my charisma, here's my power to throw spells, so forth and so on. But in addition to that, you know, then they make games where the whole thing is purely statistical. Um, so, so it's almost as if they bureaucratize anti-bureaucratic fantasy. And you could think of um, social media in the same way, which mm -hmm. I, I think you're suggesting. That's a nice idea that, that you know, you take the very freedom of, of, of pure sociality, which is the very opposite of, of bureaucracy, and increasingly bureaucratize it and quantify it and make it more and more impersonal. Mm -hmm. Another example, what would you, uh, would you say that the bureaucracy is the enemy of research and teaching mm. rather than helping the administration of a university? Well, it's possible to have a bureaucracy that would help. And I imagine in certain points of history there has been such things. But, and, you know, Gayatri Spivak uh, made a, visited the Occupy people at one point, and she made one comment that really stuck in my head. She said, you know, 20 years ago when people said the university, you know, the university says this, the university does that, you know, they would mean the faculty, maybe 30 years ago. You know, nowadays when they say the university, they mean the administration. Um, the, the, the bureaucracy that runs the university is the university, and you're just working for it. Um, this was brought home to me. I was up for a job at Cambridge once, a name chair, some professorship, and I didn't even come near to getting it. Uh, but I, the reason I was dismissed, I heard this later, it was reported to me, is that one of the high up administrative dean or something or whatever they have at Cambridge, you know, sort of looked over my qualifications and said, oh, he's obviously a very smart guy, but um, I can't use him for anything. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't do anything with him. And I thought, you know, there was a time when, you know, professors at Cambridge saw administrators in those terms, you know, <laughs> they're, they're, they're there to help us do what we want to do. <laughs> How did it come about that even professors at Cambridge are there to help some administrator do what he wants to do? I mean, who cares what he wants to do? <laughs> and um, so, so, yeah, it's turned around in a very, very dramatic way. And, and the results of that are seen in almost every aspect of educational life. I looked at science, um, which is not what I do myself, obviously, but I thought it was very telling. I have an essay where I talk about why is it we haven't had the same type of constant theoretical and technological breakthroughs that we were used to having from, say, 1750 to 1950. You know, it seems to stop at a certain point, and especially after the 70s. Um, and I, I suspect that one reason is exactly that bureaucratization of academic life. You know, instead of like leaving people alone to come up with ideas and giving them a sense of security, access to other creative people they can hang around with. You know, we have this system where everybody who has any sign that they might be possible of some kind of creative breakthrough has to spend most of their time either competing with one another to try to convince people with money that they already know what they're going to come up with, um, or alternately trying to prove that the other guy doesn't. Your book helps us to better understand mechanisms of modern bureaucracy, mm -hmm. but what is your main recommendation? What shall we do to reduce bureaucracy, to get a more social bureaucracy, supporting the public welfare instead of generating more and more rules? Well, I think that you know, I'm a great believer in democracy. Um, I think that you know, the global justice movement was my initial paradigm for this because it was, in retrospect, I think a lot of people who are involved in it realize that it essentially was an anti-bureaucratic movement. Uh, we didn't think of it that way at the time. You know, what we were opposing with the IMF and the World Bank was essentially a planetary, well, planetary administrative bureaucracy that nobody was supposed to think of as such, that we, we weren't supposed to know exists. Um, and you know, we juxtaposed to that bureaucratic order the idea of direct democracy, these vast assemblies where people would make decisions without a leadership structure. 
And um, I think that that idea of sort of reinventing things from the bottom up is one element in that. But I think there's very specific programs that people have been talking about recently which would go a large way in reducing the worst aspects of bureaucracy. I'll just give one. Um, it's a big movement in a lot of places nowadays for basic income guarantees rather than having these very, very elaborate welfare systems where lead to people being constantly judged and monitored. Um, you know, just have a flat rate, everybody in the country gets a base income, and um, the rest can sort itself out. Now, it would have to be generous, and certain things would have to be guaranteed, like housing, otherwise they just yank up the price of housing, right? So, you know, ha housing, education, uh, health would still have to be taken care of. But if you have a basic income, um, well, think about it, like most rich countries employ thousands and thousands and thousands of people just to kind of make poor people feel bad about themselves. You know, they're constantly monitoring and telling them what a bad job they're doing at raising their children or how, are they really looking for a job hard enough, you know, so forth and so on. Almost every aspect of your life is constantly being inspected and found wanted. The people doing that, they don't like those jobs, they're miserable, right? I mean, if you have basic income, you could both get rid of them and say, to, well, we don't care if you're good enough to have them. Everybody's good enough to have the money. You're alive. You're good enough to have the money. Um, so, so, and then all those people who you know used to have to spend their lives like monitoring poor people to be middle class, you know, they'd be free too. They'd have basic income. They could go form a band or write poetry or something, and probably contribute like a lot more to society than than they're doing now. What would be better, an independent bureaucracy or more controlled by democracy of bureaucracy? Well, both. I mean, I mean, well, I mean. It's interesting, bureaucrats, you know, I don't want to only put bureaucrats down. Like right now in the UK, it's actually largely the technocrats who are objecting to the current economic policies. You, know, you have this constant cry of austerity from the politicians, and it's people like you know, institutions like the Bank of England, who are actually saying, well, now, wait a minute, that's based on false economics. Um, you know, that's not actually how it works. They're the only people really, really raising a you and cry. So, you know, some parts of that civil st structure of civil servants have, have something to say for themselves. But I think it's really important to establish sort of the principle that you don't need to have these monitoring systems to tell people what they're worth. We should read your book. I think um, everybody should read my book, uh, or at least buy it. Uh, <laughs> uh, but um, I think you know it would be useful to be read for anybody, especially on the left, who's interested in why it is that left-wing populist movements don't take off, why right-wing movements do whenever there's an economic crisis or social crisis. Because I really think the fact that the lack of a left-wing critique of bureaucracy is a big problem. Um, we've, we've ceded ground to the right, which was naturally ours. And I really want to start a debate on that. And I, I hope the people concerned of that will pick the book up. Thank you very much, David Graeber. That's book from David Graeber. Bureaucratie, mm -hmm. die Utopie der Regeln, is by Klett Cotter. Kürzlich erschienen. Thank you very much.